Chapter thirty three of A Son of the Middle Border by Hamlin Garland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The End of the Sunset Trail. In February, while attending a conference of reformers in St. Louis, I received a letter from my mother which greatly disturbed me. I wish I could see you, she wrote. I am not very well this winter. I can't go out very often, and I get very lonesome for my boys if only you did not live so far away there was something in this letter which made all that i was doing in the convention of no account and on the following evening i took the train for columbia the little village in which my parents were spending the winter filled with remorseful forebodings my pain and self-accusation would not let me rest something clutched my heart every time i thought of my crippled mother prisoned in a dakota shanty and no express train was swift enough to satisfy my desire to reach her the letter had been forwarded to me and i was afraid that she might be actually ill that ride next day from sioux city to aberdeen was one of the gloomiest i had ever experienced not only was my conscience uneasy it seemed that i was being hurled into a region of arctic storms a terrific blizzard possessed the plain and the engine appeared to fight its way like a brave animal all day it labored forward while the coaches behind it swayed in the ever-increasing power of the tempest their wheels emitting squeals of pain as they ground through the drifts and i sitting in my overcoat with collar turned high above my ears my hands thrust deep in my pockets silently counted the hours of my discomfort the windows furred deep with frost let in but a pallid half-light thus adding a mental dust to the actual menace of the storm after each station the brakemen re-entered as if blown in by the blast and a vapor white as a shower of flour filled the doorway behind them occasionally as i cleared a space for a peephole through the rimy panes i caught momentary glimpses of a level treeless earth desolate as the polar ocean swept by ferocious elemental warfare no life was to be seen save here and there a suffering steer or colt humped under the lee of a straw stack the streets of the small wooden towns were deserted no citizen was abroad only the faint smoke of chimneys testified to the presence of life beneath the roof trees occasionally a local passenger came in puffing and whistling with loud explosions of excited comment over the storm which he seemed to treat as an agreeable diversion but the conductor who followed threshing his hands and nursing his ears swore in emphatic dislike of the country and climate but even this controversy offered no relief to the through passengers who sat in frozen stoical silence there was very little humor in a dakota blizzard for them or for me at six o'clock that night i reached the desolate end of my journey my father met me at the station and led the way to the low square bleak cottage which he had rented for the winter mother still unable to lift her feet from the floor opened the door to us and reaching her as i did through that terrifying tempest made her seem as lonely as a castaway on some gelid greenland coast father was in unwanted depression his crop had again failed to mature with nearly a thousand acres of wheat he had harvested barely enough for the next year's seed he was not entirely at the end of his faith however on the contrary he was filled with desire of the farther west the irrigated country is the next field for development i am going to sell out here and try irrigation in montana i want to get where i can regulate the water for my crops you'll do nothing of the kind i retorted you'll go no further west i have a better plan than that the wind roared on all that night and all the next day and during this time we did little but feed the stove and argue our widely separated plans i told him of franklin's success on the stage with hearn and i described my own busy though unremunerative life as a writer and as i took the world from which i came shone with increasing splendor little by little the story of the country's decay came out the village of ordway had been moved away nothing remained but a grain elevator 
many of our old neighbors had gone to the irrigation country and more were planning to go as soon as they could sell their farms columbia was also in desolate decline its hotel stood empty its windows broken its doors sagging nothing could have been more depressing more hopeless and my throat burned with bitter rage every time my mother shuffled across the floor and when she shyly sat beside me and took my hand in hers as if to hold me fast my voice almost failed me i began to plead father let's get a home together somewhere suppose we compromise on old nashunok where you were married and where i was born let's buy a house and lot there and put a deed in mother's name so that it can never be alienated and make it the garland homestead come mother's brothers are there your sister is there all your old pioneer comrades are there it's in a rich and sheltered valley and is filled with associations of your youth haven't you had enough of pioneering why not go back and be sheltered by the hills and trees for the rest of your lives if you'll join us in this plan frank and i will spend our summers with you and perhaps we can all eat our thanksgiving dinners together in the good old new england custom and be happy mother yielded at once to the earnestness of my appeal i'm ready to go back she said there's only one thing to keep me here and that is just as grave poor little girl it did seem a bleak place in which to leave her lying alone but the old soldier was still too proud too much the pioneer to bring himself at once to a surrender of his hopes he shook his head and said i can't do it hamlin i've got to fight it out right here or farther west to this i darkly responded if you go farther west you go alone mother's pioneering is done she is coming with me back to comfort back to a real home beside her brothers as i grew calmer we talked of the past of the early days in iowa of the dimmer yet still more beautiful valleys of wisconsin till mother sighed and said i'd like to see the folks and the old coolie once more but i never shall yes you shall i asserted we spoke of david whose feet were still marching to the guidance of the sunset of burton far away on an island in puget sound and together we decided that placid old william sitting among his bees in gill's coolie was after all the wiser man of what avail this constant quest of gold beneath the far horizon's rim father i bluntly said you've been chasing a will-o'-the-wisp for fifty years you've been moving westward and always you have gone from certainty to uncertainty from a comfortable home to a shanty for thirty years you've carried mother on a ceaseless journey to what end here you are snowbound on a treeless plain with mother old and crippled it's a hard thing to say but the time has come for about face you must take the back trail it will hurt but it must be done i can't do it he exclaimed i've never backed water in my life and i won't do it now i'm not beaten yet we've had three bad years in succession we'll surely have a crop next year i won't surrender so long as i can run a team then let me tell you something else i resumed i will never visit you on this accursed plain again you can live here if you want to but i'm going to take mother out of it she shall not grow old and die in such surroundings as these i won't have it it isn't right at last the stern old captain gave in at least to the point of saying well we'll see i'll come down next summer and we'll visit william and look the ground over but i won't consider going back to stay till i've had a crop i won't go back to the old valley dead broke i can't stand being called a failure if i have a crop and can sell out i'll talk with you very well i'm going to stop off at salem on my way east and tell the folks that you are about to sell out and come back to the old valley this victory over my pioneer father gave me such relief from my knowing conscience that my whole sky lightened the thought of establishing a family hearth at the point where my life began had a fine appeal all my schooling had been to my great to keep moving if your crop fails go west and try a new soil if disagreeable neighbors surround you sell out and move 
always toward the open country to remain quietly in your native place is a sign of weakness of irresolution happiness dwells afar wealth and fame are to be found by journeying toward the sunset star such had been the spirit the message of all the songs and stories of my youth now suddenly i perceived the futility of our quest i felt the value i acknowledged the peace of the old the settled the valley of my birth even in the midst of winter had a quiet beauty the bluffs were draped with purple and silver still blue shadows filled the hollows of the sunlit snow the farmhouses all put forth a comfortable settled homey look the farmers themselves shaggy fur-clad and well-fed came into town driving fat horses whose bells uttered a song of plenty on the plain we had feared the wind with a mortal terror here the hills as well as the sheltering elms which defended almost every roof stood against the blast like friendly warders the village life though rude and slow-moving was hearty and cheerful as i went about the streets with my uncle william gray-haired old pioneers whose names were startlingly familiar called out hello bill adding some homely jest precisely as they had been doing for forty years as young men they had threshed or cradled or husked corn with my father whom they still called by his first name so you are dick's boy how is dick getting along he has a big farm i replied nearly a thousand acres but is going to sell out next year and come back here they were all frankly pleased is that so made his pile i suppose enough to live on i guess i answered evasively i'm glad to hear of it i always liked dick we were in the woods together i hated to see him leave the valley how's bell this question always brought the shadow back to my face not very well but we hope she'll be better when she gets back here among her own folks well we'll all be glad to see them both was the hearty reply in this hope with this plan in mind i took my way back to new york well pleased with my plan after nearly a third of a century of migration the garlands were about to double on their trail and their decision was deeply significant it meant that a certain phase of american pioneering had ended that the woods and prairie lands having all been taken up nothing remained but the semi-arid valleys of the rocky mountains irrigation was a new word and a vague word in the ears of my father's generation and had a little of the charm which lay in the flowery savannas of the mississippi valley in the years between eighteen sixty five and eighteen ninety two the nation had swiftly passed through the buoyant era of free land settlement and now the day of reckoning had come end of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of a son of the middle border by hamlin garland this librivox recording is in the public domain we go to california the idea of a homestead now became an obsession with me as a proletariat i knew the power of the landlord and the value of land my love of the wilderness was increasing year by year but all desire to plow the land was gone my desire for a home did not involve a lonely cabin in a far-off valley on the contrary i wanted roads and bridges and neighbors my hope now was to possess a minute isle of safety in the midst of the streaming currents of western life a little solid ground in my native valley on which the surviving members of my family could catch and cling all about me as i travelled i now perceived the mournful side of american enterprise sons were deserting their work-worn fathers daughters were forgetting their tired mothers families were everywhere breaking up ambitious young men and unsuccessful old men were in restless motion spreading swarming dragging their reluctant women and their helpless and wandering children into unfamiliar hardships at times i visioned the middle border as a colony of ants which was an injustice to the ants for ants have a reason for their apparently futile and aimless striving 
my brother and i discussed my notion in detail as we sat in our six by nine dining room high in our harlem flat the house must be in a village it must be new england in type and stand beneath tall elm trees i said it must be broad based and low you know the kind we saw dozens of them on our tramp trip down the connecticut valley and we'll have a big garden and a tennis court we'll need a barn too for father will want to keep a driving team mother shall have a girl to do the housework so that we can visit her often and so on and on things were not coming our way very fast but they were coming and it really looked as though my dream might become a reality my brother was drawing a small but regular salary as a member of hearn's company my stories were selling moderately well and as neither of us was given to drink or cards whatever we earned we saved to some minds our lives seemed stupidly regular but we were happy in our quiet way it was in my brother's little flat on one hundred and fifth street that stephen crane renewed a friendship which had begun a couple of years before while i was lecturing in avon new jersey he was a slim pale hungry-looking boy at this time and had just written the red badge of courage in fact he brought the first half of it in his pocket on his second visit and i loaned him fifteen dollars to redeem the other half from the keep of a cruel typist he came again and again to see me always with a new roll of manuscript in his ulster now it was the man in the storm now a bunch of the black riders curious poems which he afterwards dedicated to me and while my brother browned a steak steve and i usually sat in council over his dark future you will laugh over these lean years i said to him but he found small comfort in that prospect to him i was a man established and i took an absurd pleasure in playing the part of successful author it was all very comical for my study was the ratty little parlor of a furnished flat for which we paid thirty dollars per month still to the man at the bottom of a pit the fellow on top in the sunlight is a king and to crane my brother and i were at least dukes an expression used by sudraman in his preface to dame care had made a great impression on my mind and in discussing my future with the hearns i quoted these lines and said i am resolved that my mother shall not rise from the feast of life empty think of it she has never seen a real play in a real theatre in all her life she has never seen a painting or heard a piece of fine music she knows nothing of the splendors of our civilization except what comes to her in the newspapers while here i am in the midst of every intellectual delight i take no credit for my desire to comfort her it's just my way of having fun it's a purely selfish enterprise on my part catherine who was familiar with the theory of egoistic altruism would not let my statement go uncontradicted she tried to make a virtue of my devotion to my parents no i insisted if batting around town gave me more real pleasure i would do it it don't in fact i shall never be quite happy till i have shown mother sure acres and given her an opportunity to hear a symphony concert meanwhile having no business adviser i was doing honorable things in a foolish way with no knowledge of how to publish my work i was bringing out a problem novel here a realistic novel at there and a book of short stories in a third place all to the effect of confusing my public and disgusting the bookseller but then no one in those days had any very clear notion of how to launch a young writer and so as i had entered the literary field by way of a side gate i was doing as well as could have been expected of me my idea it appears was to get as many books into the same market at the same time as possible as a matter of fact none of them paid me any royalty my subsistence came from the sale of such short stories as i was able to lodge with the century and harper's the youth's companion and the arena the Bacheller syndicate took a kindly interest in me and i came to like the big blonde dreaming youth from the north country who was the nominal head of the firm irving Bacheller even at the time struck me as more of a poet than a businessman 
though i was always glad to get his check for it brought the garland homestead just that much nearer on the whole it was a prosperous and busy winter for both my brother and myself chicago was in the early stages of building a world's fair and as spring came on i spent a couple of weeks in the city putting prairie folks into shape for the printer kirkland introduced me to the chicago literary club and my publisher francis short took me to the press club and i began to understand and like the city as may deepened i went on up to wisconsin full of my plan for a homestead and the green and the luscious slopes of the old valley gave me a new delight a kind of proprietary delight i began to think of it as home it seemed not only a natural deed but a dutiful deed this return to the land of my birth it was the beginning of a more settled order of life my aunt susan bailey who was living alone in the old house in onalaska made me welcome and showed grateful interest when i spoke to her of my ambition i'll be glad to help you pay for such a place as she said provided you will set aside a room in it for me i am lonely now your father is all i have and i'd like to spend my old age with him but don't buy a farm buy a house and lot here or in la crosse mother wants to be in west salem i replied all our talk has been of west salem and if you can content yourself to live with us there i shall be very glad of your cooperation father is still skittish he will not come back till he can sell to advantage however the season has started well and i am hoping that he will at least come down with mother and talk the matter over with us to my delight almost to my surprise mother came alone father will follow us in a few days she said if he can find someone to look after his stock and tools while he is gone she was able to walk a little now and together we went about the village and visited relatives and neighbors in the country we ate company dinners of fried chicken and short cake and sat out on the grass beneath the shelter of noble trees during the heat of the day there was something profoundly restful and satisfying in this atmosphere no one seemed in a hurry and no one seemed to fear either the wind or the sun the talk was largely of the past of the fine free life of the early days and my mother's eyes often filled with happy tears as she met friends who remembered her as a girl there was no doubt in her mind i'd like to live here she said it's more like home than any other place but i don't see how your father could stand it on a little piece of land he likes his big fields one night as we were sitting on william's porch talking of war times and of you and jane and walter a sweet and solemn mood came over us it seemed as if the spirits of the pioneers the mcclintocks and dudleys had been called back and were all about us it seemed to me as to my mother as if luke or leonard might at any moment emerge from the odorous june dusk and speak to us we spoke of david and my mother's love for him vibrated in her voice as she said i don't suppose i'll ever see him again he's too poor and too proud to come back here and i'm too old and lame and poor to visit him this produced in me a sudden and most audacious change of plan i'm not so certain about that i retorted frank's company is going to play in california this winter and i am arranging a lecture tour i've just decided that you and father shall go along the boldness of my plans startled her oh we can't do a crazy thing like that she declared it's not so crazy father had been talking for years of a visit to his brother in santa barbara aunt susan tells me she wants to spend one more winter in california and so i see no reason in the world why you and father should not go i'll pay for your tickets and edison will be glad to house you we're going i asserted firmly we'll put off buying our homestead till next year and make this the grandest trip of your life aunt maria here put in a word you do just what hamlin tells you to do if he wants to spend his money giving you a good time you let him mother smiled wistfully but incredulously to her it all seemed as remote as improbable as a trip to egypt but i continued to talk of it as settled and so did william and maria i wrote at once to my father outlining my trip 
and pleading strongly for his consent and cooperation all your life long you and mother have toiled with hardly a day off your travelling had been mainly in a covered wagon you have seen nothing of cities for thirty years addison wants you to spend the winter with him and mother wants to see david once more why not go begin to plan right now and as soon as your crops are harvested meet me at omaha or kansas city and we'll go along together he replied with unexpected half promise the crops looks pretty well unless something very destructive turns up i shall have a few dollars to spend i'd like to make that trip i'd like to see edison once more i replied the more i think about it the more wonderful it all seems it will enable you to see the mountains and the great plains you can visit los angeles and san francisco you can see the ocean frank is to play for a month in frisco and we can all meet at uncle david's for christmas the remainder of the summer was taken up with the preparations for this gorgeous excursion mother went back to help father through the harvest whilst i returned to boston and completed arrangement for my lecture tour which was to carry me as far north as puget sound at last in november when the grain was all safely marketed the old people met me in kansas city and from there as if in a dream started westward with me in such holiday spirits as mother's health permitted father was like a boy having cut loose from the farm at least for the winter he declared his intention to have a good time as good as the law allows he added with a smile of course they both expected to suffer on the journey that's what travel had always meant to them but i surprised them i not only took separate lower berths in the sleeping car i insisted on regular meals at the eating houses along the way and they were amazed to find travel almost comfortable the cost of all this disturbed my mother a good deal till i explained to her that my own expenses were paid by the lecture committees and that she need not worry about the price of her fare perhaps i even boasted about a recent sale of a story if i did i hope it will be forgiven me for i was determined that this should be the greatest event in her life my father's interest in all that came to view was as keen as my own during all his years of manhood he had longed to cross the plains and to see pike's peak and now while his approach was not as he had dreamed it he was actually on his way into colorado by the great horn spoons he exclaimed as we neared the foothills i'd like to have been here before the railroad here spoke the born explorer his eyes sparkled his face flushed the farther we got into the houseless cattle range the better he liked it the best times i've ever had in my life he remarked as we were looking away across the plains at the faint shapes of the spanish peaks was when i was cruising the prairie in a covered wagon then he told me once again of his long trip into minnesota before the war and of the cavalry lieutenant who rounded the settlers up and sent them back to st paul to escape the sioux who were on the war path i never saw such a country for game as northern minnesota was in those days it swarmed with waterfowl and chicken and deer if the soldiers hadn't driven me out i would have had a farm up there i was just starting to break a garden when the troops came it was all glorious to me as to them the spanish life of las vegas where we rested for a day the indians of laguna the lava beds and painted buttes of the desert the beautiful slopes of the san francisco mountains the herds of cattle the careering cowboys the mines and miners all came in for study and comment we resented the nights which shut us out from so much that was interesting then came the hot sands of the colorado valley the swift climb to the bleak heights of the coast range and at last the swift descent to the orange groves and singing birds of riverside a dozen times father cried out this alone is worth the cost of the trip mother was weary how weary i did not know till we reached our room in the hotel she did not complain but her face was more dejected than i had ever seen it and i was greatly disturbed by it our grand excursion had come too late for her a good night's sleep and a hearty breakfast restored her to something like her smiling self and when we took the train for santa barbara she betrayed more excitement than at any time on our trip 
do we really see the ocean she asked yes i explained we run close along the shore you'll see waves and ships and sharks maybe a whale or two father was even more excited he spent most of his time on the platform or hanging from the window well i never really expected to see the pacific he said as we were nearing the end of our journey now i'm determined to see frisco and the golden gate of course that is a part of our itinerary you can see frisco when you come up to visit david my uncle edison who was living in a plain but roomy house was genuinely glad to see us and his wife made us welcome in the spirit of the middle border for she was one of the settlers of green county wisconsin in an hour we were at home our host was as i remembered him a tall thin man of quiet dignity and notable power of expression his words were all chosen and his manner urbane i want your people to settle right down here with me for the winter he said in fact i shall try to persuade richard to buy a place here this brought out my own plan for a home in west salem and he agreed with me that the old people should never again spend a winter in dakota there was no question in my mind about the hospitality of this home and so with a very comfortable a delightful sense of peace of satisfaction of security i set out on my way to san francisco portland and olympia eager to see california all of it its mountains its cities and above all its poets had long called to me it meant the argonauts and the song of the sierras to me and one of my main objects of destination was joaquin miller's home in oakland heights no one else so far as i knew was transmitting this ghost life into literature edwin markham was an oakland school teacher frank norris a college student and jack london a boy in short trousers miller dominated the coast landscape the mountains the streams the pines were his a dozen times as i passed some splendid peak i quoted his lines sierras eternal tents of snow that flash over battlements of mountains nevertheless in all my journeying throughout all my other interests i kept in mind our design for a reunion at my uncle david's home in san jose and i wrote him to tell him when to expect us franklin who was playing in san francisco arranged to meet me and father and mother were to come up from santa barbara it all fell out quite miraculously as we had planned it on the twenty fourth of december we all met at my uncle's door this reunion so american in its unexpectedness deserves closer analysis my brother had come from new york city father and mother were from central dakota my own home was still in boston david and his family had reached this little tenement by way of a long trail through iowa dakota montana oregon and northern california we who had all started from the same little wisconsin valley were here drawn together as if by the magic of a conjurer's wand in a city strange to us all can any other country on earth surpass the united states in the ruthless broadcast dispersion of its families could any other land furnish a more incredible momentary reassembling of scattered units the reader of this tale will remember that david was my boyish hero and as i had not seen him for fifteen years i had looked forward with disquieting question concerning our meeting alas my fears were justified there was more of pain than pleasure in the visit for us all although my brother and i did our best to make it joyous the conditions of the reunion were sorrowful for david who like my father had been following the lure of the sunset all his life was in deep discouragement from his fruitful farm in iowa he had sought the free soil of dakota from dakota he had been lured to montana in the forests of montana he had been robbed by his partner reduced in a single day to the rank of a day laborer and so in the attempt to retrieve his fortunes he again moved westward ever westward and here now at last in san jose at the end of his means and almost at the end of his courage he was working at whatever he could find to do nevertheless he was still the borderer still the man of the open something in his face and voice 
something in his glance set him apart from the ordinary workman he still carried with him something of the hunter something which came from the broad spaces of the middle border and though his bushy hair and beard were streaked with white and his eyes sad and dim i could still discern in him some part of the physical strength and beauty which had made his young manhood so glorious to me and deeper yet i perceived in him the dreamer the celtic minstrel the poet his limbs mighty as of old were heavy and his towering frame was beginning to stoop his brave heart was beating slow fortune had been harshly inimical to him and his outlook on life was bitter with all his tremendous physical power he had not been able to regain his former footing among men in talking of his misfortunes i asked him why he had not returned to wisconsin after his loss in montana and he replied as my father had done how could i do that how could i sneak back with empty pockets inevitably almost at once father spoke of the violin have you got it yet he asked yes david replied but i seldom play on it now in fact i don't think there are any strings on it i could tell from the tone of his voice that he had no will to play but he dug the almost unforgotten instrument out of a closet strung it and tuned it and that evening after dinner when my father called out in familiar imperious fashion come come now for a tune david was prepared reluctantly to comply my hands are so stiff and clumsy now he said by way of apology to me it was a sad pleasure to me as to him this revival of youthful memories and i would have spared him if i could but my father insisted upon having all of the jocund dances and sweet old songs although a man of deep feeling in many ways he could not understand the tragedy of my uncle's failing skill but mother did her ear was too acute not to detect the difference in tone between his playing at this time and the power of expression he had once possessed and in her shadowy corner she suffered sympathetically when beneath his work-worn fingers the strings cried out discordantly the wrist once so strong and sure the hands so supple and swift were now hooks of horn and bronze the magic touch of youth had vanished and yet as he went on some little part of his wizardry came back at father's request he played once more maggie airy sleepin and while his strings wailed beneath his bow i shivered as of old stirred by the winds of the past roaring o'er moorland craggy deep in my brain the sob of the song sank filling my inner vision with flitting shadows of vanished faces brows untouched of care and sweet kind eyes lit by the firelight of a secure abundant hearth i was lying once more before the fire in david's little cabin in the deep wisconsin valley and grandfather mcclintock a dreaming giant was drumming on his chair his face flame-lit his hair a halo of snow and gold tune after tune the old border man played in answer to my father's insistent demands until at last the pain of it all became unendurable and he ended abruptly i can't play any more i'll never play again he added harshly as he laid the violin away in its box like a child in its coffin we sat in silence for we all realized that never again would we hear those wistful meaningful melodies wordless with aching throats resentful of the present my mother and my aunt dreamed of the bright and beautiful nation of days when they were young and david was young and all the west was a land of hope my father now joined in urging david to go back to the middle border i'll put you on my farm he said or if you want to go back to nationok we'll help you do that we are thinking of going back there ourselves david sadly shook his grizzled head no i can't do that he repeated i haven't money enough to pay my car fare and besides becky and the children would never consent to it i understood his proud heart rebelled at the thought of the pitying or contemptuous eyes of his stay-at-home neighbors he who had gone forth so triumphantly thirty years before could not endure the notion of going back on borrowed money better to die among strangers like a soldier father stern old pioneer though he was could not think of leaving his wife's brother here 
working like a chinaman dave has acted the fool he privately said to me but we will help him if you can spare a little we'll lend him enough to buy one of these fruit farms he's talking about to this i agreed together we loaned him enough to make the first payment on a small farm he was deeply grateful for this and hope again sprang up in his heart you won't regret it he said brokenly this will put me on my feet and by and by perhaps we'll meet in the old valley but we never did i never saw him again i shall always insist that a true musician a superb violinist was lost to the world in david mcclintock but as he was born on the border and always remained on the border how could he find himself his hungry heart his need of change his search for the pot of gold beyond the sunset had carried him from one adventure to another and always farther and farther from the things he most deeply craved he might have been a great singer for he had a beautiful voice and a keen appreciation of the finer element of song it was hard for me to adjust myself to his sorrowful decline into old age i thought of him as he appeared to me when riding his threshing machine up the coulee road i recalled the long rifle with which he used to carry off the prizes at the turkey shoots and especially i remembered him as he looked while playing the violin on the far-off thanksgiving night in lewis valley i left california with the feeling that his life was almost ended and my heart was heavy with indignant pity for i must now remember him only as a broken and discouraged man the david of my idolatry the laughing giant of my boyhood world could be found now only in the mist which hung above the hills and valleys of neshinoc end of chapter thirty four Chapter thirty five of A Son of the Middle Border by Hamlin Garland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Homestead in the Valley. To my father, the Golden Gate of San Francisco was grandly romantic. It was associated in his mind with Bret Hart and the gold seekers of forty nine, as well as with Fremont and the Mexican War. Hence, one of his expressed desires for many years had been to stand on the hills above the bay and look out on the ocean i know boston he said and i want to know frisco my mother's interest in the city was more personal she was eager to see her son franklin play his part in a real play on a real stage for that reward she was willing to undertake considerable extra fatigue and so to please her to satisfy my father and to gratify myself I accompanied them to San Francisco, and for several days, with a delightful sense of accomplishment, my brother and I led them about the town. We visited the Seal Rocks and climbed Knob Hill, explored Chinatown and walked through the old Spanish Quarter, and as each of these pleasures was tasted, my father said, Well, now, that's done, precisely as if he were getting through a list of tedious duties. There was no hint of obligation, however, in the hours which they spent in seeing my brother's performance as one of the three twins in Incog. The piece was in truth very funny and Franklin hardly to be distinguished from his star, a fact which astonished and delighted my mother. She didn't know he could look so unlike himself. She laughed herself quite breathless over the absurd situations of the fuss, but father was not so easily satisfied this foolery is all well enough said he but i'd rather see you and your friend hearn in shore acres at last the day came when they both expressed a desire to return to santa barbara we've had all about all we can stand this trip they confessed whereupon leaving franklin at his job we started down the valley on our way to addison garland's home which had come to have something of the quality of home to us all we were tired but triumphant one by one the things we had promised ourselves to see we had seen the plains the mountains the desert the orange groves the ocean all had been added to the list of our achievements we had visited david and watched franklin play in his troupe and now with a sense of fullness of victory we were on our way back to a safe harbor among the fruits and flowers of southern california 
this was the pleasantest thought of all to me and in private i said to my uncle i hope you can keep these people till spring they must not go back to dakota now give yourself no concern about that replied addison i have a program laid out which will keep them busy until may we're going out to catalina and up into the ohay valley and down to los angeles we are to play for the rest of the winter like a couple of boys with mind entirely at ease i left them on the rose-embowered porch of my uncle's home and started east by way of denver and chicago eager to resume work on a book which i had promised for the autumn chicago was now full in the spotlight of the national stage in spite of the business depression which still engulfed the west the promoters of the columbian exposition were going steadily forward with their plans and when i arrived in the city about the middle of january the bustle of preparation was at a very high point the newly acquired studios were swarming with eager and aspiring young artists and i believed as many others believed that the city was entering upon an era of swift and shining development all the nearby states were stirred and heartened by this aesthetic awakening of a metropolis which up to this time had given but little thought to the value of art in the life of a community from being a huge muddy windy market-place it seemed about to take its place among the literary capitals of the world colonies of painters sculptors decorators and other art experts now colored its life in gratifying degree beauty was a work to advertise with and writers like harriet monroe henry b fuller george aid peter finley dunn and eugene field were at work celebrating each in his kind the changes in the thought and aspect of the town ambitious publishing houses were springing up and dummies of new magazines were being fanned by reckless young editors the talk was all of art and the exposition it did indeed seem as if culture were about to hum naturally this flare of aesthetic enthusiasm lit the toe of my imagination i predicted a publishing center and a literary market-place second only to new york a publishing center which by reason of its geographical position would be more progressive than boston and more american than manhattan here flames the spirit of youth here throbs the heart of america i declared in crumbling idols an essay which i was at this time writing for the forum in the heat of this conviction i decided to give up my residence in boston and establish headquarters in chicago i belonged here my writing was of the middle border and must continue to be so its spirit was mine all of my immediate relations were dwellers in the west and as i had also definitely set myself the task of depicting certain phases of mountain life it was inevitable that i should ultimately bring my workshop to chicago which was my natural pivot the hinge on which my varied activities would resolve and finally to live here would enable me to keep in closer personal touch with my father and mother in the wisconsin homestead which i had fully determined to acquire following this decision i returned to boston and at once announced my plan to howells flower another of my good friends who had meant so much to me in the past each was kind enough to express regret and all agreed that my scheme was logical it should bring you happiness and success they added alas the longer i stayed the deeper i settled into my groove and the more difficult my removal became it was not easy to surrender the busy and cheerful life i had been leading for nearly ten years it was hard to say good-bye to the artists and writers and musicians with whom i had so long been associated to leave the common the parks the library and the lovely walks and drives of roxbury was sorrowful business but i did it i packed my books ready for shipment and returned to chicago in may just as the exposition was about to open its doors like everyone else who saw it at this time i was amazed at the grandeur of the white city and impatiently anxious to have all my friends and relations share in my enjoyment of it my father was back on the farm in dakota and i wrote to him at once urging him to come down 
Frank will be here in June, and we will take charge of you. Sell the cook stove if necessary and come. You must see this fair. On the way back, I will go as far as West Salem and will buy that homestead I've been talking about. My brother, whose season closed about the 25th of May, joined me in urging them not to miss the fair, and a few days later, we were both delighted and a little surprised to get a letter from mother telling us when to expect them. I can't walk very well, she explained, but I'm coming. I'm so hungry to see my boys that I don't mind the long journey. Having secured rooms for them at a small hotel near the west gate of the exposition grounds, we were at the station to receive them as they came from the train surrounded by other tired and dusty pilgrims of the plains. Father was in high spirits and mother was looking very well, considering the tiresome ride of nearly seven hundred miles. Give us a chance to wash up and we'll be ready for anything, she said with brave intonation. We took her at her word. With merciless enthusiasm, we hurried them back to their hotel, and as soon as they had bathed and eaten a hasty lunch, we started out with intent to astonish and delight them. Here was another table at the Feast of Life, from which we did not intend they should rise unsatisfied. This shall be the richest experience of their lives, we said. With a wheeled chair to save mother from the fatigue of walking, we started down the line, and so rapidly did we pass from one stupendous vista to another that we saw in a few hours many of the inside exhibits and all of the finest exteriors, not to mention a glimpse of the polyglot amazements of the midway. In pursuance of our plan to watch the lights come on, we ate our supper in one of the big restaurants on the grounds, and at eight o'clock entered the court of honor. It chanced to be a moonlit night, and as lamps were lit, and the waters of the lagoon began to reflect the gleaming walls of the great palaces with their sculptured ornaments and boats of quaint shape filled with singers came and went beneath the arching bridges the wonder and the beauty of it all moved these dwellers of the level land to tears of joy which was almost as poignant as pain in addition to its grandeur the scene had for them the transitory quality of an autumn sunset a splendor which they would never see again stunned by the majesty of the vision my mother sat in her chair visioning it all yet comprehending little of its meaning her life had been spent among homely small things and these gorgeous scenes dazzled her overwhelmed her letting in upon her in one mighty flood a thousand stupefying suggestions of the art and history and poetry of the world she was old and she was ill and her brain ached with the weight of its new conceptions her face grew troubled and wistful and her eyes as big and dark as those of a child at last utterly overcome she leaned her head against my arm closed her eyes and said take me home i can't stand any more of it sadly i took her away back to her room realizing that we had been too eager we had oppressed her with the exotic the magnificent she was too old and too feeble to enjoy as we had hoped she would enjoy the color and music and thronging streets of the magic city at the end of the third day father said well i've had enough he too began to long for the repose of the country the solace of familiar scenes in truth they were both surfeited with the alien sick of the picturesque their ears suffered from the clamor of strange sounds as their eyes ached with the clash of unaccustomed color my insistent haste my desire to make up in a few hours for all their past deprivations seemed at the moment to have been a mistake seeing this knowing that all the splendor of the orient could not compensate them for another sleepless night i decided to cut their visit short and hurry them back to quietude early on the fourth morning we started for the lacrosse valley by way of madison they with a sense of relief i with a feeling of disappointment the feast was too rich too highly spiced for their simple tastes i now admitted however a certain amount of comfort came to me as i observed that the farther they got from the fair the keener their enjoyment of it became with bodies at ease and minds untroubled they now relieved in pleasant retrospect 
all the excitement and bustle of the crowds all the bewildering sights and sounds of the midway scenes which had worried as well as amazed them were now recalled with growing enthusiasm as our train filled with other returning sightseers of like condition rushed steadily northward into the green abundance of the land they knew so well and when at six o'clock of a lovely afternoon they stepped down upon the platform of the weather-beaten little station at west salem both were restored to their serene and buoyant selves the leafy village so green so muddy so lush with grass seemed the perfection of restful security the chuckle of robins on the lawns the songs of catbirds in the plum trees and the whistle of larks in the pasture appealed to them as part of a familiar sweet and homely hymn just in the edge of the village on a four-acre plot of rich level ground stood an old two-story frame cottage on which i had fixed my interest it was not beautiful not in the least like the ideal new england homestead my brother and i had so long discussed but it was sheltered on the south by three enormous maples and its gate fronted upon a double row of new england elms whose branches almost arched the wide street its gardens rich in grape vines asparagus beds plums raspberries and other fruiting shrubs appealed with special power to my mother who had lived so long on the sun-baked plains that the sight of green things growing was very precious in her eyes clumps of lilacs syringa and snowball and beds of old-fashioned flowers gave further evidence of the love and care with the former owner of the place had lavished upon it as for myself the desire to see my aging parents safely sheltered beneath the benignant branches of those sturdy trees would have made me content even with a log cabin in imagination i perceived this angular cottage growing into something fine and sweet and our own there was charm also in the fact that its western windows looked out upon the wooded hills over which i had wandered as a boy and whose skyline had printed itself deep into the lowest stratum of my subconscious memory and so it happened that on the following night as we stood before the gate looking out upon the sunset wall of purple bluffs from beneath the double row of elms stretching like a peristyle to the west my decision came this is my choice i declared right here we take root this shall be the garland homestead i turned to my father when can you move not till after my grain is threshed and marketed he replied very well let's call it the first of november and we'll all meet here for our thanksgiving dinner thanksgiving with us as with most new englanders had always been a date mark something to count upon and to count from and no sooner were we in possession of a deed than my mother and i began to plan for a dinner which should be at once a reunion of the garlands and mcclintocks a homecoming and a house warming with this understanding i let them go back for a final harvest in dakota the purchase of this small lot and commonplace house may seem very unimportant to the reader but to me and to my father it was in very truth epoch-making to me it was the ending of one life and the beginning of another to him it was decisive and not altogether joyous to accept this as his home meant a surrender of his faith in the golden west a tacit admission that all his explorations of the open land with whatsoever they had meant of opportunity had ended in a sense of failure on a barren soil it was not easy for him to enter into the spirit of our thanksgiving plans although he had given his consent to them he was still the tiller of broad acres the speculator hoping for a boom early in october as soon as i could displace the renter of the house i started in rebuilding and redecorating it as if for the entrance of a bride i widened the dining room refitted the kitchen and ordered new rugs curtains and furniture from chicago i engaged a cook and maid and bought a horse so that on november first the date of my mother's arrival i was able to meet her at the station and drive her in a carriage of her own to an almost completely outfitted home 
it was by no means what i intended it to be but it seemed luxurious to her tears dimmed her eyes as she stepped across the threshold but when i said mother hereafter my headquarters are to be in chicago and my home here with you she put her arms around my neck and wept her wanderings were over her heart at peace my father arrived a couple of weeks later and with his coming mother sent out the invitations for our dinner so far as we could we intended to bring together the scattered units of our family group at last the great day came my brother was unable to be present and there were other empty chairs but the mcclintocks were well represented william white-haired gigantic looking almost exactly like granddad at the same age came early bringing his wife his two sons and his daughter-in-law frank and lorette drove over from lewis valley with both of the sons and a daughter-in-law samantha and dan could not come but deborah and susan were present and completed a family roll several of my father's old friends promised to come in after dinner the table reflecting the abundance of the valley in those peaceful times was stretched to its full length and as we gathered about it william congratulated my father on getting back where cranberries and turkeys and fat squashes grew my mother smiled at this jest but my father still loyal to dakota was quick to defend it i like it out there he insisted i like wheat racing on a big scale i don't know how i'm going to come down from operating a six-horse header to scraping with the hoe in a garden patch mother wearing her black silk dress and lace collar sat at one end of the table while i to relieve my father of the task of carving the twenty-pound turkey sat opposite her for the first time in my life i took position as head of the family and the significance of this fact did not escape the company the pen had proved itself to be mightier than the plough going east had proved more profitable than going west it was a noble dinner as i regard it from the standpoint of today with potatoes six dollars per bushel and turkeys forty cents per pound it all seemed part of a kindlier world a vanished world as it is there were squashes and turnips and cranberry sauce and pumpkin pie and mince pie made under mother's supervision and coffee with real cream all the things which are so precious now and the talk was in praise of the delicious food and the exposition which was just closing and reports of the crops which were abundant and safely garnered the wars of the world were all behind us and the nation on its way back to prosperity and we were unafraid the gay talk lasted well through the meal but as mother's pies came on aunt maria regretfully remarked it's a pity frank can't help eat this dinner i wish dave and manty were here put in deborah and rachel added mother this brought the note of sadness which is inevitable in such a gathering and the shadow deepened as we gathered about the fire a little later the dead claimed their places since leaving the valley thirty years before our group had suffered many losses all my grandparents were gone my sisters harriet and jessie and my uncle richard had fallen on the march david and rebecca were stranded in the foothills of the cascade mountains rachel a widow was in georgia the pioneers of forty eight were old and their bright world a memory my father called on mother for some of the old songs you and deb sing nelly wildwood he urged and to me it was a call to all the absent ones an invitation to gather about us in order that the gaps in our hearth fire's broken circle might be filled sweet and clear though in diminished volume my mother's voice rose on the tender refrain never more to part nelly wildwood never more to long for the spring and i thought of hattie and jessie and tried to believe that they too were sharing in the comfort and contentment of our fire george who resembled his uncle david and had much of his skill with the fiddle bow had brought his violin with him but when father asked frank to play 
maggie air ye slippin he shook his head saying that's dave's tune and his loyalty touched us all quick tears sprang to mother's eyes she knew all too well that never again would she hear her best beloved brother touch the strings or join his voice to hers it was a moment of sorrow for us all but only for a moment for deborah struck up one of the lively dark pieces which my father loved so well and with its jubilant patter young and old returned to smiling it must be now in the kingdom a coming in the year of jubilo we shouted and so translated the words of the song into an expression of our own rejoicing present song after song followed war chants which renewed my father's military youth ballads which deepened the shadows in my mother's eyes and then at last at my request she sang the rolling stone and with a smile at father we all joined the chorus we'll stay on the farm and we'll suffer no loss for the stone that keeps rolling will gather no moss my father was not entirely convinced but i surrounded by these farmer folk hearing from their lips these quaint melodies responded like some tensely strung instrument whose chords are being played upon by searching winds i acknowledged myself at home and for all time beneath my feet lay the rugged country rock of my nativity it pleased me to discover my mental characteristics striking so deep into this typically american soil one by one our guests rose and went away jocularly saying to my father well dick you've done the right thing at last it's a comfort to have you so handy we'll come to dinner often to me they said we'll expect to see more of you now that the old folks are here this is my home i repeated when we were alone i turned to mother in the spirit of the builder give me another year and i'll make this a homestead worth talking about my head is full of plans for its improvement it's good enough for me as it is she protested no it isn't i retorted quickly nothing that i can do is good enough for you but i intend to make you entirely happy if i can here i make an end of this story here at the close of an epoch of western settlement here with my father and mother sitting beside me in the light of a tender thanksgiving in our new old home and facing a peaceful future i was thirty-three years of age and in a certain very real sense this plot of ground this protecting roof may be taken as the symbols of my hard-earned first success as well as the defiant gauges of other necessary battles which i must fight and win as i was leaving next day for chicago i said mother what shall i bring you from the city with a shy smile she answered there is only one thing more you can bring me one thing more that i want what is that a daughter i need a daughter and some grandchildren End of chapter 35 End of A Son of the Middle Border by Hamlin Garland Recorded by Ina Dobisha, Auckland, New Zealand